But what if I told you that we now know that every single one of us here in the room has 10,000 mutations that occur every day naturally in our bodies. So why don't we have cancer tomorrow? How come we don't all have cancer tomorrow? What is it about our bodies that protects us against that problem? We know that, uh, that uh, bacteria can be deadly. And we also know that we need to have good sanitation. And we also know, as you've heard, the microbiome, the healthy gut bacteria is really important. So we have 37 trillion healthy bacteria in our gut. So we are infected, but we're not sick. How come? And what if I told you that within the last two years, we've actually discovered two new organs in the human body. After all these years, the mesentery has now been recognized as one organ, and then the interstitium, which is the space between organs, is also a, a new super highway of information that's also considered an organ. And then what if I told you just about four weeks ago, we discovered a new brain cell in humans called the rosebud neuron. This actually underscores just how much we still have yet to learn about how our bodies actually work. So at the World Health Organization and at the United Nations, there is a recognition that one of the things that unites us is really disease because there are these non-communicable diseases like cardiovascular disease that you've heard of and cancer uh, and diabetes and obesity. That this is sort of unfortunately one of the great unions that links people together is that we share these diseases and certainly cardiovascular disease as we've heard so much about in the last few uh, talks is uh, really uh, a major burden for us and therefore something we need to get on top of. Cancer is also another uh, cause of death. I, I'm sure, I don't need to see a show of hands, but I know every single one of us in this room has been touched by cancer either directly or with somebody who we know. Could be a family member, could be a neighbor, could be a child, but some, or a coworker, somebody we know. And if you take a look by the year 2030, the number of people that will die of cancer every year, 13 million, that's like wiping out the entire country of Sweden, the entire country of Belgium, uh, and about half of Australia uh, in a single year with cancer. So we need to really be able to think about uh, whether or not there are ways of getting on top of that. You all know that there are on television these uh, commercials to do genetic screening. And of course, there's also genetic screening for cancer. Uh, and there are some cancers that in fact are uh, able to be detected with um, uh, genomic screening, only about 10% or less. Actually, most of it of cancers due to the environment. And so the interesting thing is of the environmental causes, about a third are linked to our diet. Um, as you heard earlier, bad dietary habits do cause disease. But I want to actually give you another way of uh, thinking about the, uh, our diet, which is that what about the good parts of the diet? Are there ways that we can actually invert the negative model to make it to turn our focus, uh, turn our attention to the things that are actually good in our diet, as we've heard about, that can actually fight not only cancer but heart disease and other diseases as well. So I would say that this is where science comes into play. We didn't have, for 50 years ago, the ability to look at the body, to look at our food in ways that we now actually have. We've got many more technologies, much more knowledge. And so this is allowing us to actually be at this turning point where we can cut and, and really get to the future by taking an, another path altogether. The reason that you are all here in this room, as well as my fellow speakers, is that we fundamentally believe that there is a better future ahead. And that better future is one that we actually play a role in, uh, in making the decisions. So food, of course, is one of the things that we think about when it comes to disease prevention. You don't have to go very far to find a farmer's market or if you're traveling abroad, going to a local uh, town or village market to find an abundance of food that's out there. And obviously, if you go to health conferences like this, people are talking about their favorite foods. I think we all agree here, there's no such thing as a true superfood. There's no magic bullet that actually is gonna solve all of our problems as much as we would like there to be. And so how do we actually reconcile our desire to find the magic answer with all the science that's emerging and how do we then translate that into our everyday lives? And that's really what I wanna actually share with you. The first thing you should know 
is that we are way beyond just listing our favorite foods and saying that they are actually the treatments for disease. As you've seen earlier, there are lists of different foods that we now know, and we're beginning to dive in to say, what is inside that food? What are the natural substances, whether it's fiber, whether it's a vitamin, whether it's an oil, whether it's um, uh, another bioactive? So you can see here on the list of foods on the far left-hand column, a list of bioactives. So we're still discovering what the natural chemicals are uh, in these foods. We are also beginning to use epidemiological studies, which is studies of the community to find out um, what the outcomes of eating these foods are. And when you actually then look at the data, you can begin asking what are the doses that have been calculated and to be associated with an outcome. This is not cause and effect. This is associations that allow us to ask other questions and have some ideas of where to go further. And I think um, uh, Dr. Campbell's gonna talk about that further. But the outcomes can be quite amazing. If you look on the far right hand side of this uh, table, you can see that there's decrease of some of the cancers that we care about, prostate cancer, breast cancer, kidney cancer, decrease in diabetes, even decrease in all cause mortality. These are the types of studies that you can actually um, uh, integrate into our collective knowledge base about food. Um, my organization has been also asking some really interesting questions. In other words, can we go from our knowledge, our tools that we use to look at pharmaceuticals and actually compare plants and foods to them? So we call this from farm uh, or pharma to farm. And this is a, just a simple uh, graph showing on the top black column the effect on blood vessels, healthy blood vessels that drugs, which are seen in yellow and in blue, actually have in a test. It doesn't really matter what the exact test is, just assume, you can just uh, uh, take it for granted that I'm telling you that these are the different effects of different drugs, whether it's an antibiotic, whether it's a statin, whether it's a steroid, whether it's a, a non-steroidal uh, anti-inflammatory agent. And then what's really interesting is that we can take the same tools that pharmaceutical companies use, as seen here, and begin testing foods side by side. And not surprisingly, you're seeing that some of the effects in these types of laboratory assays show you that the uh, natural chemicals within foods can actually have, go head to head against some of the drugs. This is not actually in patients. This is actually taking a look at the natural power of what mother nature has loaded into the foods. And of course, many pharmaceutical um, products actually originally came from natural sources. And so when you hear about this concept of food as medicine, I want you to just remember that it's possible to use the tools of medicine to actually begin looking at food. That's really one of the areas that I think is going to explode into the future that we should be paying attention to. Now I mentioned to you it's not just about the food. I mean, it is about the food, but it's really more about our bodies and how our body reacts to food. And everybody is a little bit different. This is a whole area of precision medicine. As you know, we're beginning to get away from thinking about cancer just as the organ that it's actually in, but we're beginning to look way down deep into the genomics, the DNA, the RNA, the protein to kind of understand, to uh, really kind of get into and peel apart the mysteries of the body. And that's really where my background is. I started in vascular biology. Um, I, worked in on, I work in oncology, cardiovascular disease, diabetes and its complications, vision. I've been involved with helping to bring about 32 FDA approved medicines that have um, helped to shift the way that um, uh, cancers are treated, that vision loss is treated, and also that diabetic wounds are healed. If you think about your body as a fortress, how do we think about our defenses? And, from those defenses, what kind of clues can we get on how to use diet and, uh, or to understand the role of diet? So, <clears throat> you know, a fortress, uh, many of you will recognize castles. Uh, castles are really fortresses, not just where, you know, royalty live. Um, this is in England, it's in the town called Arendelle. I've actually been there myself, and it looks beautiful. But if you actually take a, a, a look at how fortresses are designed, for defense, it's really amazing. In addition to the moat, which is the part that goes around the outside, many of you may not know that the talus is actually that curve in the wall that people from the top used to drop boulders that would shatter in the bottom and send shrapnel to repel the enemy. With the st spiral staircase um, uh, uh, always uh, goes up in a, in a clockwise fashion. 
And that's because when you're defending from the top, if you're right-handed, you can strike down. And if you're rushing from the bottom of the stairs and trying to swing up right-handed, you're at a disadvantage. That's a defense. And, and I did not know this myself, but most castles have something called a murder hole, which is right at the entrance. When people uh, invade the castle, there's a giant hole right, in top, uh, right on top of the doorway that people can drop oil and, and rocks to try to you know, repel the enemy. And so again, castles are these amazing structures that were um, part of the community, but they were designed to defend them. They were designed for defense. And so I want you to think about what we know about our body's defense systems. We are hardwired with, and I'm just gonna show you five of them because these are the five that I'm working on right now. And these five are angiogenesis, which is our blood supply that brings oxygen and nutrients to every part of our body, every cell. Um, uh, our stem cells, which actually help us regenerate. Uh, our uh, microbiome, which we've heard about already, our bacteria. Our ability for our DNA to protect itself and our immune system. And the amazing thing about these defense systems is they are standalone. Each one defends us against a number of diseases. I'm gonna show them to you. But these are common denominator defense systems and they support each other. You know, if you take a look at Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, these are like these uh, troops that are actually these um, uh, divisions that actually all work together to defend the body. Now, uh, I, I do wanna come back to food. We're gonna talk about food, uh, obviously. Um, and so when you see an apple growing on a tree, what you might not be thinking about is how over evolution, Mother Nature evolved those plants, the fruits, uh, things that we eat, to be packed with natural chemicals that actually protect the plant. So what are, they, what are those protecting? They're um, natural bioactive chemicals and they often repel insects to prevent the uh, insects from eating up the plant and destroying it. They are often uh, colorful pigments that attract bees so that you can actually get pollination. This is sexual defense um, you know, for, for reproduction. So often the bioactives and foods that work in our bodies actually were originally evolved in the plants that we eat. We're talking about whole food, plant-based diets. They had a function originally in the plant. When we evolved as humans and picked those plants up and started to eat them, these natural chemicals suddenly had a new job. That new job is interacting with our human cells to do something new. And that's what we're discovering. And that's where the new science of, of how foods interact with our body is actually starting. All right, let me just give you a few examples of what we're learning, just to give you, uh, inspire you to think about your, the foods that you're eating and actually the data you saw earlier in slightly different ways. Angiogenesis, this is a Greek word that's about the growth, how the body grows blood vessels. It's about the circulation. We had good circulation, we are able to operate uh, fine. If we have poor circulation, as you heard um, Dr. Esselton uh, talk about, you have compromised blood flow, you can't walk very far, you got a problem. Or in the heart, you got a blockage, your heart actually starves, is starved of oxygen. On the other hand, if you, blood vessels can be hijacked to have really deadly consequences. These are normal blood vessels under the microscope. You can see they all look different. The liver, they look like river tributaries for a river. In the lung, they're um, vessels pressed against air sacs. In the heart, they're really richly supplying um, uh, the heart muscle. And along nerves, blood vessels are like telephone lines of course along nerves to keep the nerves alive. That's a special circulation that nerves actually have. Now, what's interesting is how the body keeps this natural balance. You, know, you don't want to have too many, you don't want to have too few, you want to have just the right amount. And so the body is able to grow more blood vessels when it needs better blood flow or after working out exercise. There's a fitness stand back there, somebody uh, or, or a trainer. Um, you want to work out, you're going to build some muscle, uh, you're going to actually need more blood vessels. The body can do that. Um, and after it grows the blood vessels, if there, if there's a lawnmower kind of that mows back the lawn and prunes the blood vessels back to where you need to be, back for balance. If you don't have enough blood vessels, like after surgery or after injury, you need to grow new vessels back. Well, the body can do that too. You can actually grow more blood vessels to fill up that space. And that's actually what you see under a scab when after you uh, cut yourself, it's that red, red uh, stuff. If you can't grow blood vessels or, um, uh, or prune them back, that's when diseases start. When this defense system is compromised, you wind up having diseases. And the diseases are the ones that you can, uh, we've talked about some of them. 
Too many blood vessels, you wind up having cancer, vision loss, and diabetes and aging, psoriasis, arthritis, endometriosis, Alzheimer's disease, obesity, fat cells require blood vessels to grow. When you actually have not enough blood vessels, you can actually have coronary disease, you don't have enough um, bypasses, natural bypasses, or in a stroke after the blockage in the brain, you want more blood vessels to grow, even hair loss. And I suppose it was a little prescient for me to put erectile dysfunction, since everybody seems to have an erectile dysfunction story. Um, I, will, I will find a way to feather that in, but it's true. You don't have good enough nerves, those nerves don't have a good enough blood supply, as we've heard about. And so that's insufficient angiogenesis. We don't have, a, we don't have the right balance. So. Um, let's talk about um, the diseases that result when we have too many blood vessels. What can we actually do about those? So I'm going to start with cancers because cancers are forming all the time in our body, uh, uh, and, but they will usually be inconsequential. They're about the size of the head of a, of, of a ballpoint pen. They, can't, they don't have a blood supply, so they'll actually uh, disappear. Your immune system will take care of it. But when they actually are able to attract their own blood supply, recruit their own private blood supply, the blood vessels actually may feed the cancer cells and a tumor can grow. About 16,000 times in about two weeks once a blood vessel starts feeding them. So it's a massive trigger for cancer growth. So there are now uh, medicines that have been developed, or new strategies to cut off the blood supply to cancer. So the medicines exist. This is a, a eagle's eye view of a little ring that's of the big blood vessel, the aorta, that you heard about earlier. And these, those white little hairs that you see are actually those endothelial cells that you heard about, those, their lining cells. When you, um, put, when you grow them in a laboratory, they will naturally want to fan out because they want to go someplace if they're not in a body. And so this is what cancers do. They actually um, cause, they spark these blood vessels to grow all over the place like in a starburst. Now, if you actually extract the bioactive genistein from soybeans and you put them into the system, look at how you shut down all those blood vessels that might be feeding a cancer. It's pretty interesting that genistein from soy actually can shut down blood vessels. So one of the interesting questions is, now isn't that a problem for cancer? Doesn't soy have these estrogens that actually are dangerous for people, women who are afraid of breast cancer? Turns out that's a complete urban legend, like so many things that are out there about food and health. Phytoestrogens are plant estrogens, and this is what they actually look like, all right? You don't have to memorize this, but just, I want you, here's what I want you to do now. This is what a human estrogen looks like. Do they look the same? They're completely different. And so actually the phytoestrogen from plants block the human estrogen receptor. It's kind of like a natural tamoxifen, in fact. And so the, you know, the skeptic would say, well, okay, you're making that case, they look this different, but does this actually mean anything in real life? Because that's where it counts. This is now where you start taking a look at large epidemiological population studies. This was published in JAMA in 2009. This is the Shanghai Breast Cancer Survival Study in which they enrolled um, 5,042 women with breast cancer. So this group would be the ones that would be hosed the most if they were actually um, going to be uh, worse, their situation would be worse. But what is what they found over five years? That, the, that if the women who ate soy had a 29% decrease in the risk of death during that period of time and a 32% decrease in the risk of the cancer coming back if they had it surgically removed. This is the complete opposite of making breast cancer worse. This is helping patients who have breast cancer. And how much do you need to have? I, I mentioned something about dosing. When you go back and look at this paper and do the calculations, the amount of soy that you would need to take uh, to get this result is 10 grams uh, of soy protein a day. How much is 10 grams of soy protein a day? It's about, it's about the amount you'd find in one cup of soy milk. All right, not a lot, practical. And in Asia, if you have breast cancer, people don't freak out and say, don't eat soy. In fact, they feed you more soy. And so again, we have to think about the cultural relativism. We actually have soy in a lot of things that we eat. Not all of them are good, a lot of processed foods. But in Asia, if you think about the Asian diet, there's a lot of soy proteins that are actually commonly um, uh, consumed. Now, here's 17 studies looking at breast cancer and soy um, associations. And, if, uh, and you can see all the studies show um, that the balance of evidence suggests that 
Soy actually helps improve breast cancer survival. It does not cause death from breast cancer. So again, this is the kind of evidence that is helpful. And I encourage all of you guys, when you're thinking about the evidence for food and health, it's all about the science, it's all about the evidence. You know, this is, it's, we're just trying to figure out, we don't know all the answers, but we just need to see the data. I'm showing you the data because I think it's a useful way for you to have the information to make up your own minds. Tomatoes, they have lycopene. Uh, and so th they have also been studied for their anti-angiogenic benefits because lycopene is anti-angiogenic. Well, that's interesting, but does it actually make a difference? Well, uh, there have been some large studies called the Harvard Professionals Follow-Up Study involving 46,000 men that have been followed over 20 years, and it was found that consuming two to three cups of cooked tomato sauce was associated with a decreased risk of prostate cancer by about 30%. Now that doesn't mean that everybody avoided prostate cancer, but there was clearly an association with a risk reduction associated with a food that contains a bioactive that we know stops one of the processes that drives cancer growth. So it makes sense. Our world is better when it makes sense. We are able to make decisions better when things make sense. And that's really what I think this is all about. Now for the men who did develop prostate cancer, when they actually did the uh, pathology and the biopsies, they found that the men who ate more tomato sauce had less aggressive and fewer blood vessels in their cancer. So again, this is really kind of going the whole hog of all the studies going all the way down to the patients who did develop cancer to look for blood vessels, angiogenesis feeding their cancers. Now here's a couple of interesting things beyond that data. And this is something that I think uh, anybody who wants to put you know, information to use. Preparing your tomatoes actually makes a difference. You want to simmer your tomatoes um, uh, about 190 degrees. Uh, 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 you'll um, change the amount of lycopene available for your body. Why? If you eat a typical red tomato off a vine from your garden, it tastes great. You get lots of vitamins from it. But the lycopene is in a form uh, that's called uh, trans, and it's very difficult for your body to absorb. It's one chemical form of the, of the, of the, uh, of the lycopene. If you heat it, you change the chemical structure naturally, and you change the trans to the cis form, and suddenly your body can absorb it. So at two minutes of heating um, uh, tomato sauce, you suddenly make it 50% more available. And after you simmer it for 30 minutes, it's 250 times more available. And so again, how we treat our food makes a difference as well. Um, there have been studies looking at cooking tomatoes in uh, water, and you can uh, actually uh, uh, get the lycopene out, and you can see that there's some lycopene that goes into the bloodstream. But lycopene, uh, for those of you who uh, uh, have taken chemistry at some point in your uh, careers, um, is a fat soluble, it's an oily molecule. It dissolves better in oil than in water, right? So oil and water don't mix. Lycopene loves oil. So while there are all the cautions that have been given to oils in our, uh, uh, in our uh, uh, day today, if you cook tomato sauce in olive oil, the lycopene gets into your bloodstream a lot more easily because it doesn't get flushed through, now it gets absorbed into your body, all right, by a lot. What kind of olive oil would you want to use? I'm not talking about the endothelial effects, I'm talking about the anti the, you know, the, I'm not talking about the lining effects, and I'm talking about the anti-androgenic effects. Well, it turns out that olives are not all the same. If you look across many of the olive species, there are three varietals of olives that have the highest number of anti-androgenic, cancer-starving polyphenols. One's Italian from, uh, uh, from Umbria, Moriolo. One is Greek from Peloponnesus. It's the Koronecki olive. One's from Spain. It's called the Picuau olives. This is actually a partial list of anti-androgenic foods. Um, that you can have. They do other things as well. Many of them have antioxidant effects, many of them pro-endothelial effects, um, uh, but they are the ones that definitely have anti-androgenic uh, effects uh, as well. Now, what about the other side of the equation where you actually have insufficient, not enough blood vessels, and you want to grow more? Can you help your body prompt that? As we age, you know, we, our, our circulation tends to not do as well, partly because of the blockages you've seen, but also just in general, our blood flow tends to be a little bit less spry uh, as we age. Uh, so, how about angiogenesis stimulating foods? This is a relatively new area that I'm really excited about. Um, can we um, prompt blood vessels to grow where we need them? Well, it turns out barley 
actually contains a natural chemical called uh, beta uh, D-glucan uh, that also stimulates your immune system, by the way, but it actually um, causes your body to make more of the substance that grows blood vessels. And in fact, they've studied this in a laboratory and all, the only thing you need to know with that picture is that those orange circles I'm showing you, that when you actually um, uh, provide lab animals with uh, uh, barley, uh, and this is, by the way, you're feeding them pasta made with barley, barley pasta. You can see that there is more uh, blood vessels growing in those animals that have been fed uh, pasta made with barley. Okay, there's another uh, pro-endergenic food um, that is uh, foods. It's a substance really called ursolic acid. Where do you find it? Fruit peels, apple peels. I mean, how many times you, you're making a pie, you're peeling the apple, all the peels you throw away. Well, there's a new way of thinking about sustainability. Maybe some of the stuff in the trash is actually good for us and we should set it aside and find other things to do with it. By the way, it's not just apple peel, it's cranberry peels, blueberry peels, cherry peels. Dried fruit are a really great source of this because the skin is dried right onto it. And this, you can see that you heard about nitric oxide making blood vessels healthier. It turns out foods with ursolic acid help um, increase our nitric oxide so our blood vessels are happier and they'll grow more blood vessels. This is actually um, a, um, an experiment where um, one side of the animal's leg on the left side, that's just all blue, doesn't have good blood flow. But when you start treating them with ursolic acid, feeding them foods with ursolic acid, you can see at the end of three weeks, you should say weeks there, you can see the blood flows come back. It's grown new vessels. Nitric oxides have the blood vessels, the endothelial cells are happier, as you had heard about earlier. This is a dietary approach to this um, that is actually quite meaningful. Um, so these, this is, I don't have time to go into every single food, but this is, there's a l growing list of foods that have angiogenesis stimulating properties. Now you might say, wait a minute, you just showed me cancer. We don't want blood vessels and we want, and you have heart, you want blood vessels. How do we actually know if one thing's going to cause a problem for the other? This is where the body seems to know exactly what to do. There is a zone, a Goldilocks zone that knows exactly how many blood vessels need to be there. Mm -hmm.